So guys, good afternoon. I'm glad you're here again. And I'm gonna introduce my husband to you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mario, my husband, for accepting my invitation to be here with us and to be uh, speaking to us about one of the things that he loves the most in his life. Me? No. <laughs> Polly folks. Okay. Uh, Actually, especially Brazilian comic books. So let me introduce him. Uh, Mario is an award-winning Brazilian comic book author, uh, writer, illustrator, and teacher in love with the spectacular language of the sequential arts. Active in the Brazilian comic scene since the early 2000s, he has published his works in dozens of titles from his own solo work to group anthologies. His stories range over a variety of genres and always bring a poetic and introspective look at the characters' emotions and relationships. His most notable works are the series Pieces, Parte de, de Mim, Therapy, Terapia, and Monsterverse, Monstruário, as well as the adaptation of literary classics like Don Casmurro uh, from Machado de Assis, we talked about him a little bit, and and of Green Gables, among many others. Mario had the honor of being nominated several times for the most relevant awards in Brazil's ever-expanding co comic ecosystem, having won the Agake Mix, the Jabuti, and the Angelo Agostin multiple times. Always devoted to mentoring new artists, uh, his teaching career also spans over almost 20 years. He also creates content for a YouTube channel where he brings the life of a professional artist to the spotlight, to the spotlight with lectures, tutorials, reviews, and good old friendly chats. Uh, currently living in a small town in Long Island with his wife, he is eager to participate in the comic book universe of the US, bringing all the experience gathered from a life devoted to the medium. So welcome, Mario. Thank you for being here. Thank you, guys. Hi, guys. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Professor Vicentini, for inviting me. It's an honor. Uh, like Monica said, I'm going to talk to you, to you guys about comic books, and especially Brazilian comic books, since we're focusing uh, on this course. I, I mean, we. I sound like I'm the teacher with you, right? And just, uh, you're focusing on Brazilian culture and, and history. Uh, and many times, some things are forgotten. I, I know you don't have time, enough time, to talk about everything in Brazil or every kind of entertainment or art made in Brazil, I know. Uh, but usually when you, you get like a hierarchy of things you're going to talk about, it's literature, poetry, uh, movies. Brazil has a, like a, a, a huge TV uh, production, a lot of TV shows, and comics. We usually forget about comics uh, because mostly, uh, and I'm talking about Brazil here, but I guess the same kind of uh, perception might be real in the United States. I don't think it's the case like in Japan, for example, or in like France, Belgium. But usually comics are something you associate with kids and nerds. That's wrong. <laughs> it's kids, nerds, and everybody else, okay? So first of all, it's uh, a language. It's a way of communica communicating, expressing. Uh, it's a way of telling stories, just like movies and like books. So. Of course, it was generally uh, associated with kids because it was originally made for kids. It's usually very juvenile. But since that time, comics have evolved to become much more. As movies did, as TV did, as books and video games and board games. It, all of those things are like vast universes that we can explore. It's not just the tip of the iceberg, okay? So, uh, let's talk about comics. 
Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah. I drew this when I was a little bit younger. Okay, so my beard was not as wide as it is, it is now. So these are uh, some covers of some of my work, some of my books. Uh, I have been making comics since at least 2002. Uh, and I, I haven't been drawing since I was a kid. So like family legend says that I draw since I was two years old and I never stop it. Thank God. So now I can be here talking to you guys about this. Uh, so I make comics because I love the, the medium, I love the language, I love the way we can associate words and images and graphic design and poetry and music and movies and everything um, in, in a kind of easy to understand form of communicating. Okay, uh, let's see. First thing, thing I, I need to know, actually before that, all the images you're going to see during this presentation are Brazilian artists, okay? Uh, so if, I don't know if you like something or you wanna ask something or like names or stuff like that, I have a list by the end of the lecture uh, of books you can find here in the US made by Brazilian authors. Uh, but anytime you want to ask something, just raise your hand or throw something at me, okay? Uh, I usually talk a lot, so you need to interrupt me, okay? True. True, she knows, she knows. Okay, first of all, uh, who reads comics among you guys? Yeah, nice. Okay, so when I say comics, I mean superhero, comic strips, newspaper strips, uh, webtoons, manga, manhwa. I mean European comics, I mean like fanzine, underground stuff, anything that is made by telling a story between drawings and texts, that's comics, okay? So many people say like, uh, I hear this a lot in Brazil. Oh, I don't read comics. I just read like these authors on Instagram. Okay, you're reading comics, but I don't read the books. No problem, you're reading comics. Or people who say, oh, no, I don't read comics because I, li I read manga. No, you're reading comics. Is there someone here who is more than a reader? Some, someone that uh, makes comics, draws or writes, or wants to, or writes about comics, or has a podcast, or has a YouTube channel, or is secretly uh, a Marvel comics artist in disguise? No? Okay. Okay, no problem. What is comics? Okay, so... Uh, First of all, let's talk a little bit about this comic strip right here. Um, this is a comic strip by Mauricio de Souza. I'm going to talk more about this guy because he's really, really important for Brazilian comics. And this is a very, very historical, important comic book strip. It was published in a newspaper in 1960-something, 64, I guess. Uh, and it was the first appearance of this character, this right here. Remember this angry girl, she's going to be very important. Uh, also, she has the most beautiful name in the world. Do you guys try to guess her name? Monica. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Monica. She is one of the most f famous characters by Mauricio de Souza. Okay, she, this is the very first appearance of the character. She doesn't have a name here. She's not called by name, but she would eventually be uh, named Monica and would like lead Mauricio's work to stardom. But we will get there, we'll get there eventually. But first of all, when we say comics and we're like, in saying comics, we're saying like newspaper strips and manga and all, all of those, those things, what are they? How can we say, like, this is comics, this is not comics? Also, why are they called comics if they're not, uh, they don't need to be funny anymore? Any guesses? What makes a comic comic? No? You guys know it. You're just shy. <laughs> 
guess like any story told in the form of a uh, series of pictures a bit short. That works. Yeah. That works. Um, drawn pictures. Yeah, but then actually we could have like a whole semester. She won't let me do it, but we could have like a whole semester talking about what comics can be. They can be a lot of things. Uh, we can make comic books with photographs and with typography and with like graphs. We can, why not? So it's easy, kind of easier to say what is not comics. But when we're talking about, like you said, uh, like a deliberate sequence of images, uh, many times with the help of text, but text, they, it comes in a form of like a, a graphic way of visualizing sound. So the word balloons are not actually uh, banners floating around the characters. They are like, okay, sometimes they can be. I've read, uh, I've read comics where they take the word balloon and hit the other character with the balloon. So it can be done. But usually it's this. We have like panels with drawings. Sometimes they have text and they are uh, positioned in a deliberate order for you to read. And the most important thing here is something we don't even see. I love this part. It's the gap between the panels. This right here is the most important thing in comics. Why? Why am I being so existential, so surrealistic? Well, guys, we can see what's happening in the panels, right? But we can't see what happened between panels. The magic of the, the medium, the language, is that you, as a reader, each of you will make a conclusion of what happens in this interval, in this gap, based on what you see here, first and what you see next nobody's telling you guys what happens from here to here but we can see the the angry girl hits the the spike haired boy then she left and he sat down but we don't see him sitting down we don't he's, we don't see her leaving we just know that she did because there are visual clues for that okay it can be much more than that. It can be super experimental, but basically it's this. Um, uh, here are some of my pages. Uh, there's black and white, there's cartoony, there is more realistic, there is like digital coloring, there is watercolor, there is drama, humor, um, horror historical, there's a lot of, of stuff. So when we talk about comics, we can't restrain our perception to just one genre of stories or one style of drawing or one way of coloring it. It's, it's infinite. So maybe, uh, I mean like, oh, I don't read comics because comics are for kids. Okay, so try to find comics for adults. Uh, I really like, um, let's say, uh, Victorian age romances. Okay, so go find a comic about that. There is comics about that. Actually, there are adaptations of Jane Austen, for example. You just have to find it. Um, and comics are like this nest of uh, new ideas. A lot of the movies and TV series and video games that you guys see uh, nowadays, they are based on comic books. For example, Umbrella Academy, the TV series from Netflix, is based on a comic book co-created by a Brazilian. And things like that. Of course, Spider-Man is based on comic books, but sometimes you just don't know that, like, the end of the fucking world, sorry for the bad, but also a series in Netflix based on a comic book. So, Walking Dead. Walking Dead, yeah, Walking Dead was based on a comic book. Uh, yeah, we, we could, like, be the whole, the whole afternoon here naming movies and video games and stuff like that, but uh, what we need to know is that whatever kind of story or narrative or style you like, you will find a comic book about it somewhere. It might be Brazilian, it might be Korean, it might be Russian, it might be American, but you will find it. Maybe you have to pay for it, 
Maybe you read it for free on webtoons. Or maybe you're going to pirate it. <laughs> okay. No problem. Comics are universal. You can be anywhere in the world and you will understand the language of comics. So this is a, a strip by Elo D'Angelo. Uh, she is a, she's very famous in Brazil right now. Also, her this is a strip from a book uh, she just published about uh, body positivity. And she makes a lot of comics based on like her view of the world, like feminism and body positivity and gender fluidity and things like that. She's really famous and she's super nice. Uh, this comic's from a book that she recently published, and it was the first comic book uh, Harper Collins published in Brazil. So she started the whole comic book line from Harper Collins, which is like a huge uh, publishing house. Uh, so we all can understand this. We all can understand the idea of her loving herself because there is like her reflection is coming out of the mirror and they are hugging and they are happy. You don't need text and you don't need a lot of context. You could argue that nobody can go out of a mirror. You can just like summon your own reflection from a mirror. I know, but people can fly either and Superman is flying, so whatever, you know? You just understand the message behind it all. It is universal uh, for readers. And it is universal for creators. So some people say, oh, I could never make a comic book because I can't draw. Dude, draw stick figures. That's a comic. That's like narrating your story through images and text. Or only balloons. Or only balloons. Yeah. A friend of mine, I love to, to I don't have it to show to you guys, sorry, but a friend of mine, uh, he's a writer and he doesn't know how to draw. And he wanted to start publishing um, comic strips, like uh, comic strips. And he, uh, I can't get a, uh, an artist. He started making these strips only with the word balloon. So there were like uh, three panels, four panels with just the text. And then he would show you how to uh, better understand the jokes by changing the color of the text, the shape of the word balloon, you know, because there's like regular talking voice, screaming voice, thought balloon, whispering. He would change the balloon to change the volume of the voice. He would change the font on the, in the balloon to change the kind of voice the character has. And he would change the color of the background. So when a character like said something really angry, the background would be just red. And when he calms down, the background would be gray or light blue. So he would use the resource he had, words and the language and the vocabulary of comics to tell his jokes. And it's worked. The series was called Mil Palavras, which means a thousand words. Because, well, a thousand words and an image. What's the same? An image is worth more than a thousand words? I guess. Well, okay. Anyway. Uh, comics are universal, so if you have an idea, if you want to make comics or read comics or go after comics, just do it. There's no uh, gatekeepers. Actually, there are. There are a lot of stupid people out there, but anyway. Uh, okay, so I'm here to talk to you guys about História em Quadrinhos. This is how we call comic books in Brazil. Uh, there are other names, but mainly História em Quadrinhos, which literally means stories in frames. Uh, quadrinho would mean little square or, or a little frame. And we have a distinction here in English, uh, stories and history. But in Brazil, we use história for both. So it is history, it is story. Okay. You can make history in frames too. Um, it's a clever way of calling comics because they are actually stories being told in a sequence of frames. So it works. But also, we call comics GB. This is a popular term. It's like saying uh, kind of a slang word for comic books. Uh, and it has like a funny and weird history behind it. Okay, so 
back in 19, I'm just guessing here, but back in 1930, 40s, 60s, 70s, there was this magazine called Gibi. It was an anthology magazine uh, publishing Brazilian comics, but mostly imported comics. So they had like, uh, I don't know if you guys can see, but this is uh, Captain Marvel, the first Captain Marvel, not Carol Danvers, but Billy Batson. Okay, I'm too nerdy right now, sorry. But Shazam. Uh, we have here Flash Gordon, we have Popeye, Ali Oop, we have Beetle Bailey, uh, Hagger the Horrible, Peanuts, uh, The Spirit, stuff like that. So they would like get the rights to publish in Brazil, the comics that were being made uh, abroad and publish in GB. So GB actually is a very old word from, from Portuguese that means that is like a slang for a little black kid. And the mascot of the comic was a little black boy, drawn in a ridiculously uh, stereotypical and racist way. But you guys remember it was 1930. Sucks, but uh, it took a long time for them to drop the mascot, but the name stuck. So most people in Brazil will understand GB not as a racist slang, but as comics. So you go to the store to buy your RGBs. That's it. Uh, I'm very thankful that we stole this word and made it mean something better. But we also say gibizinho, we say revistinha, we say revista, we say HQ, which is HQ, the initials for story in quadrinhos. Uh, but usually GB is more popular. Okay. Uh, this magazine doesn't exist anymore. So it's long gone and, and the name is still with us. Uh, but the thing is, we're talking about Brazilian comics here. What makes a comic Brazilian? And what do you think? Um, well, I assume it means, um, my, my first thought would be made by a Brazilian author artist mm -hmm. because, um, like, obviously the content could be like anything like you said like it could even be like arbitrary event you know mm -hmm. um that could be kind of reproduced anywhere in the world but like what makes it brazilian is like it was made by a brazilian author obviously of course there are comics i'm sure that have brazilian culture within mm -hmm. it that also, so, yeah. also make it that but i would take the first and foremost like part of the Brazilian life yeah i guess we can all agree that it works yeah it's, yeah, it's actually pretty um Straight to the point, if it's made by Brazilians, Brazilian. if it's made in Brazil, it works too. Uh, if it, it depicts Brazilian culture in some way, some way or uh, Brazilian historical facts, or Brazilian, uh, I don't know, literary classics being adapted, you could say, okay, that's Brazilian comics. Uh, but I mean, we live in a globalized world. Everything is everywhere. And we have like manga artists making manga, in France, but are they manga for being friends? Because, oh, okay, I, I'll try not to get too technical, but every manga is a comic book, but not all comic books are manga. So every Brazilian comic book is a comic book, but you know? So we have Brazilian artists making comics for the international market. We have a lot of Brazilians drawing for Marvel and DC and Dark Horse and Image. And we have Brazilians drawing to the Japanese industry also. Uh, but usually the combination of geography and the culture that you're depicting and the nationality of the authors would make a comic book Brazilian. But never the aesthetics. Usually not the themes or the... Actually, maybe the geography that you show. You know, you are in Brazil making comics, but you're drawing like a fantasy land. It's not in Brazil, it's not anywhere, but it's too Brazilian. Uh, it's really hard to determine what makes a comic book Brazilian, aside from being made in Brazil by Brazilians. Uh, and that's like an important point for us to understand because there's no, uh, there's no anchor to it. Uh, when I see my Korean like comics, 
it's like I feel like it was made for Koreans because like there's like Korean culture that we, mm-hmm. we the only Korean can understand and only we like we see in our daily life so it is for ours so I think Brazilian comics are more like more for Brazilians so like mm-hmm. so they will see what they hear from their parents or their ancestors and what have they like experienced in their daily lives what like it's, I, I mean like it's not made for the Brazilian but like it's more easier for Brazilian to understand and more like be into the comics I think that's what makes the comic Brazilian yeah it really works um, some comics Brazilian comics they they really have like a, a, a learning curve so sometimes you need to know more about Brazil to get a better understanding of that comic the same way uh, in Korea same way, same way everywhere uh, but funny thing is uh, in Brazil uh, we're very used to consuming international uh, art and entertainment. So we probably know more about Korean culture by comics and like BTS and K-dramas. Oh no, what's the name? Doramas, yeah. stuff like that. Because people are consuming it a lot. Uh, we also know a lot about the American, the North American way of life and culture and, and stuff because we watch trends. I mean, we grew up watching Friends and, and, I don't know, Jurassic Park and Disney movies. So we know a lot about what's outside. Uh, and that makes like, I, I wanna, I wanna like, make a, a, a parenthesis here for you guys. Uh, there are superhero comics in Brazil. There are people drawing like the Japanese artists draw. There are comics in Brazil that we could say like, they look like European comics. And that's because we consume that. We read a lot of manga, so it's easy for uh, like a, uh, a young author, a young artist to want to draw in the same style as their heroes do. You know, uh, what happens is we're making like weird uh, Frankenstein monsters of comics, because most of Brazilian superhero comics they write and draw the superheroes as if they were American superheroes. And American superheroes don't work in Brazil. I mean, they don't work here too, because, well, 2023, nobody believes a guy with a span, color, uh, colorful spandex flying around and being super heroic. But anyway, you know, it's cultural. But anyway, uh, all of this is Brazilian comics and more. We have a lot to, to to show for you guys, but let's let's move on. So, uh, a little bit of histories in small frames. I want to talk to you guys about uh, a couple of people that are really, really, really important for Brazilian comics. I mean, if you had to take like this one-hour course, crash course on Brazilian comics, I would have to ma- name this guy. Uh, first of all, this drawing is by Flavio Colin. Uh, he's no longer with us. He's already deceased, but he was one of the greatest. Uh, comic book authors from the 70s to the 90s, more or less. He was very active. Uh, and he was mostly forgotten by the younger generations. Mostly because uh, we consume a lot of international uh, IPs and stuff like that, of course. But also because we have a bad uh, habit of not celebrating our own uh, history, our own heroes. In, in, in comics, especially, okay, uh, he's being like brought back, uh, especially because of uh, comic book uh, publishing houses in Brazil. They're like getting all his old books and republishing it. So there's been like a Flavio Colin Renaissance in Brazil, and I'm very happy because he deserves it. So, but I'm not going to talk. Ironically, I'm not going to talk about Flavio Colin for you guys. Uh, I'm going to start with Angelo Agostini, actually. This guy, born in 1843 and deceased in 1910, uh, is mostly known as the father of Amer- uh, sorry, as the father of Brazilian comics. Ironically, he's Italian. How come? Okay, you guys know there's a lot of immigration in Brazil. The Italians went to Brazil uh, during this period. Okay. And uh, Agostini went to Brazil, he was young, and he's, he was a journalist and an, uh, uh, an illustrator 
an artist, and he was a, a an advocator for like I would say entertainment. So he f uh, he had newspapers. He founded the first and most important newspaper dedicated to kids in Brazil called O Tico Tico. It lasted like for almost a, a century. He didn't last for almost a century, but his work did. Uh, but the thing is, we, we regard this guy as the father of Brazilian comics because of this comic strip. This is uh, accepted by everybody in Brazil for uh, people who study comics and journalists and stuff like that, that this is the first modern conception of comics ever published in Brazil. So uh, I have the dates here. Is 1869. 1869, guys. It was a long time ago. So this was published back then. It is a deliberate sequence of images telling a story with the help of text. And the text is not necessarily describing the image, but complementing the images with uh, the, the words they're saying or some kind of a joke. And it's called Aventuras de Zé Caipora, which means Adventures of Zé Caipora is the character. Um, so this is the first Brazilian comic that we have a, like a, a, a registry that we have doc documented. But uh, depends on where you ask where the first comic ever was made. Some people would argue that the first comic book ever made, the first graphic storytelling ever made was in the caves. Maybe they're right, because they are a deliberate sequence of drawn images telling a story. But let's say modern age printed, okay, with the balloons and the panels. Um, some people would advocate, like especially here in the US, that Yellow Kid by Richard Felton Oldcott uh, is the first comic book, first modern comic book in history in the world. Okay, uh, and kind of, of course, they would believe that because they are American, so America first. But the first uh, Yellow Kid comic that they believe is the first ever modern day comic book, blah, 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 is from, is from 1896. And Zekai Potter was published in 69. So, you can do the math. Okay. Uh, I believe Agostini came first, but I know that Yellow Kid had a different conception of publishing a comic book because the, the markets, the industry, the publishing business was a little bit different. And culturally, it's a little bit different. But Zekai Potter was first. Okay, we won. Uh, but we also, uh, through history, uh, like I told you guys, we watch a lot of American TV, American movies, American everything, music, and we also read a lot of American comics. So these are a few covers. Uh, this is the first appearance of Superman in a Brazilian comic. This is like 1930-something, or 40, 1940-something. This is the first appearance of Captain America in a Brazilian comic. Uh, one of the first appearances of uh, Shazam, and of the Phantom. You guys know this guy? The Phantom? No. It's because it's really old. It's really, really old. Uh, the Phantom was created, uh, I guess, in the late 30s, like 1937, 8, next to Batman. Uh, and there's a curiosity here that you see he's wearing this uh, red uniform. But Brazil is the only place in the world, as far as I know, where the Phantom wears red because his original clothing is purple. Uh, you guys have any guesses on, on why the Phantom wears red in Brazil? Yes. Also, crappy printing. Not just cheaper, but because uh, Brazilian printing methods back then were uh, not as good and it was easier and cheaper to make red instead of purple. And every time they tried to print purple, it would look like a, a muddy gray. So they, they gave up. 
so this character, he's red in Brazil, and everybody knows the Phantom wearing red, but he wears purple. Also, another curiosity is sometimes when uh, the Brazilian publishers, they ran out of American comics to publish, to translate and publish, they would like start making their own, like X-Men. Uh, this is a recently published uh, book. Uh, it looks old because it's really old, it's from the 60s. Uh, X-Men were published in Brazil and then they ran out of comics and then they just let the, the, the guys in Brazil start making X-Men comics. And they are really weird. <laughs> uh, it's not like Marvel let them licensed them. They just did it. <laughs> you know, the Brazilian publishers thought, oh, do, 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 do stuff. So they did like Nick Fury, they did the Avengers, they did the X-Men, like creating these stories in Brazil. Uh, this is not canon. This is not uh, also easy to find and it's not legal also. <laughs> but I don't know, they, they managed to republish this recently in Brazil and I think it's hilarious. But uh, Comics have, have been like imported and translated in Brazil since forever. But we also make our own comics, of course. Agostini was there. So we also have superheroes. And we also have comics, like comical comics, funny comics. Uh, this is Raio Negro, uh, translates to Black Bolt or Black Lightning. He's kind of a uh, Green Lantern type of, type of guy. He has a, an energy ring. He was also a fighter pilot. Maybe there's a bit of copyright issues there. But, uh, this is Judoka as the Judo Master. I love his outfit. Uh, this is Capitão Guitarra, which would mean like Captain Guitar. Uh, they're all from like the, the 60s and 70s, so they're really old. Uh, these are Reco Reco Bolão and Azeitona. They are like, uh, like three uh, rascals, mischievous kids uh, doing whatever. And this guy is funny because his name is O Amigo da Onça. O Amigo da Onça translates literally to the friend of the jaguar. You know that Brazilian jaguar, the white with the, the yellow with the black dots? So the friend of the jaguar. Why is he called the friend of the jaguar? So the thing is, it's an expression in Brazil. When you say somebody is the friend of a jaguar, it means that they are uh, very, very uh, uh, what's the term I used? Uh, it's a person who likes to take advantage of others, who would like... You can't tr can trust. You couldn't trust a person like that. He would always uh, have their own interests first. And all of his comics and, and, and cartoons were about him taking advantage of somebody else and being extremely sarcastic about it. So the friend of the the Jaguar. We have many more, but yeah. We have to talk about like the, the great medallions, the great names, the biggest authors in Brazil. And I'm gonna start with the biggest of them all, Maurício de Souza. Uh, do you remember that angry girl back there who shares a name with our beloved teacher? This is her. This is Monica. Uh, Maurício de Souza, born in 1935, is still active, is still doing a million things but not drawing or writing. He's like a businessman right now. Uh, he created basically an empire. Uh, we could easily say that he is our Walt Disney or our Osamu Tezuka. He is the greatest cartoonist ever in Brazil. Uh, not just because he was good at drawing or writing, but because what he could accomplish with his work. Uh, it's not easy in Brazil to become as big as this guy became. He's everywhere. His creations are everywhere. Like Monica's Gang, everybody knows Monica's Gang. Everybody learns to read with Monica's comic books. It's, it's, it's uncanny. Uh, he also made an empire by licensing the characters to products, toys, uh, TV shows, cartoons, video games, board games, clothing, diapers. Moni uh, baby Monica diapers are very famous in Brazil. Monica's ramen is famous in Brazil. Monica's apples are famous in Brazil. You know, so maybe when uh, if you get like somebody, uh, I mean, I'm not a parameter because I am a comic book enthusiast, but everybody, uh, if you talk to people in Brazil, anybody, do you know Turma da Monica? Do you know Monica's gang? Everybody does. 
they might not read, still read the comics, but they know about the characters. And they have Maybe like... that's why they think it's a kid's thing, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. In Brazil, it's, it's very uh, common for people to associate comics to children because of Monica's gangs, comics. Uh, I mean, they are everywhere and they are very uh, culturally relevant. So they, may, they, they kind of became almost a synonymous to comic books in Brazil. Uh, and Mauricio is the head of it all. This is Mauricio's first published comic book strip uh, in 1959. So uh, we have like this kind of politician guy uh, making a speech and very angry and just uh, uh, waving his hands and people start going away, going away, and then he gets frustrated and goes away and then the boy rescues his dog who was under the box the whole time. <laughs> okay. So this boy is Franjinha. In English, he's usually called Franklin. And the dog is Bidu. In English, he's called Blue because he's blue. So this was the first comic book published by Mauricio. And from this point on, he would just expand and grow and expand and grow and be more and more relevant, creating new characters and uh, gaining space in other medias too. This is uh, Monica's first comic book as a title character from 1970. Uh, their comics are still being published in Brazil. And the design has evolved, as you can see, that's more recent. Uh, just so you know, in numbers, uh, in 2022, the, the company, Mauricio de Souza Productions, sold more than 12 million comic books and more than 2 million books in Brazil. The character Monica is, in this year, celebrating 60 years. And she was based on Mauricio's own daughter, who is kind of like, she's uh, like a partner in, in administration in his uh, production company, all the families involved. Who is also Monica. Yeah, she, she's, she's called Monica, of course, yeah. So let me introduce you to these guys. Have you ever seen these characters anywhere? No? Uh, Monica's gang is so powerful uh, they are published in Japan, in Korea, in China, in Russia, in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Mexico. They have comics in English, but I don't know if you can find it here or if, or if they're like made in Brazil for people to learn how to talk in English or to read in English. But they are really, really, really a cultural phenomenon. Uh, guys, we grew up on this. This is like Brazilian comics in a nutshell would be this, but you know, it's so much more, but everybody knows Turma da Monica, Monica's gang. Uh, okay, but years and years and years and years of cultural relevancy and dominance. And in 20, 2009, Mauricio celebrated his 50th year making comics or making comics because he was already retired from creating the things but also he was uh, managing everything so uh, these three books were made as a celebration of his work uh, they're called the msp 50 collection msp 50 for importance uh, it would be mauricio de souza por 50 also mauricio de souza by 50 artists so in each book uh, the editors would invite 50 authors from Brazil who make who makes comics and, and cartoons to pay a homage to Mauricio, like drawing his characters or making a little story about Mauricio. It was the first time in history where Mauricio uh, allowed other artists to draw his characters in their styles. The first ever because they, he has a studio, they make a lot of comics every month, but they all draw in the house style, the one you saw in the last slide. But this was the first time that they allowed people to do that. People like me, and I drew this. Uh, this is part of my story, it's in the second book. Uh, so this is my version of the characters from uh, Monica's Gang. It was such an honor because if you think that in the entire territory of Brazil and everybody making comics 
I was one of 150 invi invited to celebrate Modi, so, so I'm really honored for that. Uh, it was back in 20, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011. Okay. But they liked the, the idea of other people drawing the Truma da Monica characters, so they started a new series called Graphic MSP. Uh, in this collection, each of these books is like a full-length graphic novel using characters from Maurício de Souza, but written and drawn in, the, in each of these artists' uh, styles. It was a revolution. It was not only uh, revolutionary because Maurício was inviting artists to play with his toys, you know, but also nobody in the great public, the great audience, nobody knew these people. I mean, I knew them. Most of them are, are my friends. I know these guys and girls. But, I mean, Danilo Beirut, who now is drawing for Marvel, he was drawing the astronaut. And Vitor and Lou Cafaggi, their brother and sister duo, making the Monica Gang comic. It was groundbreaking because for if you would go like to a, to a newsstand or to a bookstore, you would find very easily this because they have a, a, a huge distribution uh, system for these comics. So nobody knew about these authors and now they are mainstream artists because of this series. But they were all publishing their own work before that. So it's weird to know. I mean, it's just like you enjoy like an indie band, you really like them, but nobody knows about them. And then they are invited to open a show for U2 or Metallica or whatever, or Lady Gaga. Or... Suddenly they're like, everybody knows about them. And you're like, oh, I knew them from before. I know, he's my friend. He lives next door. Mm -hmm. But it's huge. It's very, very important. And it makes the, the, the cycle it created is very important because they were making independent comics and graphic novels. Suddenly they are seen by many, 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 many more people. And these people might go back and read their other work, the work that is not Monica's game. So the comic book market, uh, I mean, welcomed a lot of people because of this series. It was very important. Okay, also, because of one of these graphic novels, the graphic novel of Vitor and Luca Fagi, we got the movie. So this was, believe it or not, uh, Monica's gang, they had like uh, movies, but in animation, many times before. But this was the first time a live action production was made with the characters. It was a huge success. Uh, they made two movies and a TV series with this cast. They are now like almost adults because kids grow up. What can you do? Uh, but it was also groundbreaking and it uh, kind of allowed uh, movie production companies and TV production companies to take a look at Brazilian comics again and say, well, they have a lot of interesting stuff here. We could make a TV series out of it. We could make a movie. So. Things are moving, things are happening. There's a lot of new stuff coming up. Uh, one one exa example of that is Ziraldo, this very fun looking guy. He was born in 1932, he's still alive. Uh, and uh, his creations, his comics are, are very much more uh, intended for children, but he also made adult humor. Uh, his main cre creations were the Perere Gang, which is these guys here. Uh, there are characters that are animals uh, from Brazil's fauna, uh, indigenous people, and folklore characters. Uh, have you heard of the Saci? No? Okay. So this is the Saci. He is like a very, very famous uh, mythical creature in Brazil from the folklore. Uh, and he's one of the characters in Ziraldo's comics. And this little guy here is Ziraldo's like masterpiece, is the nutty kid. Nutting like crazy. Uh, it's super fun. He's like a very uh, uh, hyperactive boy. Uh, and recently, last year actually, 
since last year, actually, you can watch his cartoon on Netflix. Yeah, there was like a, a very, very beautifully produ produced, produced, yes, a beautifully produced uh, cartoon of the Nutty Kid. And there is a, an English version. You can watch it in English. It's beautiful. Uh, I have some friends who work it in the animation too. Uh, then fast forward to the 80s. Okay, we're doing like time jumps here. But during the 80s, uh, Brazil was, as you know, uh, on the brink of social collapse because of the dictatorship. The dictatorship was like ending and democracy was almost returning. And it was a period of uh, kind of the resurgency of the underground comics in Brazil. Underground in the sense that it was greedy, it was dirty, it was acid and dangerous and, and like politically incorrect. It was like getting all of the social unrest these guys had and they started making comics about it. Making fun of Brazil, making fun of Brazilian people, making fun of everything. So these are some of the most famous uh, magazines from the time. They sold like dozens of thousands of, maybe hundreds of thousands of copies every month. It's a lot for that time, especially. Uh, and among all these guys, we'll have to talk about Laerte. Uh, Laerte, born in 1951, is still alive, is still active. He's a trans woman cartoonist. Uh, she started her transition in the late 2000s, uh, after almost 30 years making comics. And then she transi transitioned, and she's still making comics. And I dare to say that Laerte is the greatest genius in Brazilian comics ever. Her work is extraordinary. From the comic strips she makes, like, of a little bird, uh, playing with words for kids to like surrealistic and expressionists and existentialist comics. Uh, she also uh, used her own transition and created a character who transitioned in comics before her. So she was like experimenting with the transition in a character in a comic. It's incredible. Also, you guys could like try to find in Netflix. There is a documentary about Laerte. It's beautiful. Uh, in Portuguese, it's Laerte C, Laerte dash S E. I don't know if you guys can find it here in the U.S., but it's a beautiful documentary. Uh, they will talk about her work, but also about her transition. And she's awesome. Love Laerte. Uh, and I wanted to show, like, if I had to show one piece of work by Laerte, it has to be this comic strip. It's the most famous strip by Laerte ever. Uh, but I, I will have to give you guys context. And I will ruin the joke for you guys, but I have to explain, otherwise it won't make any kind of sense. So it's sublime. It's beautiful, it's funny, but it doesn't work in English. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> but, yeah, you have to believe me that it's, it's genius. Uh, then, by the 80s to the 90s, we had this phase in, in Brazilian comics uh, that were made like, like an assembly line. Like, every publishing house would have a studio, and they would hire writers, artists, uh, colorists, and, and, and typography artists to make comics and sell the comics. And also this was the time of the celebrity crush because many of these studio-made comics were based in celebrities in Brazil. Uh, for example, uh, so this is Turma do Arrepio. It would be like the Goosebump uh, gang. So they are like monsters, but they are cute and funny. Um, this is Zé Carioca. Probably you guys heard of him. There is a very, very fun cartoon by Disney from the 40s or 50s, I guess. It's called uh, The Three Caballeros. Uh, and there is another one called Bem-vindo a Bahia. Welcome to Bahia. And uh, Donald Duck comes to Brazil and he meets Zé Carioca. And it's super fun. 
So he's a parrot, he's carioca, he lives in Rio de Janeiro. And many, many, many Zé Carioca comics were made in Brazil by Brazilians, because who else would be, make a great Zé Carioca comic other than a Brazilian, right? So he's still being published in Brazil. Um, this is uh, the little ninja. He is a ninja, and a kid and funny. And this is Captain Ninja. He's like kind of a funny superhero uh, mentor to, to the little ninja. Um, but we also have like celebrities. Uh, I don't know, have you guys ever heard of Xuxa? The Brazilian goddess of media? No? Okay, Xuxa is, um, she was a TV host, TV show host for kids, for kids, especially for kids. We grew up watching her and listening to her songs. She was really, really famous and she still is very famous. She doesn't make TV shows for kids anymore, but yeah. Uh, this is Xuxa's comics. Uh, do you guys have, have you guys heard of Ayrton Senna, the Formula One pilot? who died tragically in 1994. One of the Senna. greatest athletes ever. Senna? Senna. Senna. This is Seninha, the, a character based on Ayrton Senna. Um, these are Trapalhões. They are like a Monty Python kind of sketch comedy group. Also, they are comics. Uh, what else? And, and this girl is from, is from uh, erotic comics. Anyways, so, People were making comics about celebrities, they were making comics about popular characters and cartoons and history facts and political facts. Comics has always, always been made in Brazil. Uh, but what, are, what, what is really, really important for me especially is the Indie Revolution, starting in the early 2000s. Uh, it was kind of next to when I started making my own comics. I started making my comics in 2004, more or less. So, because of the economy, Brazilian uh, culture, especially in comics, movies, and, and, and music, we always respond to it, you know, especially music, you know, music reflects, art usually reflects the times. Uh, and comics are no different, but usually when there is an economic, cri economic crisis, uh, comics will be the first to fall. There will be less comics being published, less people being paid to make comics, less people buying comics. So it's like a, a roller coaster. Oh, we're great. Oh, we're bad. Oh, we're great. Oh, we're bad. So here we were good. Economy was good. Culture was good. Uh, printing costs were cheaper. Uh, the internet allowed, with like early social media, allowed creators, authors, and readers to connect more. There were more publishing houses uh, starting business and publishing comics, Brazilian comics and international comics. Uh, and crowdfunding started in Brazil. It was 2011 actually, the, the first crowdfunded comic in Brazil. Uh, why is this important? Because until then, independent comics were made in a very small scale. People would like make some comics and they uh, photocopy that and staple and just sell to the friends. Very local. When this started, people, people got to send their comics to other states, to other cities. Uh, we started having more comic cons. So people would travel to sell their comics and present their work to more people. So it started expanding. And also social media, you know how it works. So everybody was... Uh, was able to reach farther. Uh, this guy right here is the mascot for Quarto Mundo, which means Fourth, fourth World. Uh, it was an uh, independent comic book collective. I was part of it for most of its existence. Uh, and the idea was to unite independent creators. And we created uh, like a, a distribution system so I would be able to send my comics to all my friends and colleagues in other states and they would be able to send their comics to me. So if you guys met me in a comic con, I would have like comics from all over Brazil to sell. It would be impossible or nearly impossible before that. Um, eventually it didn't work anymore because of a lot of reasons. So 
doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Uh, what else? Independent. And then 2010 forward, the web revolution. Social media, uh, webtoons, more crowdfunding, more comic cons, more sales, uh, especially for the people who publish online. A lot of people appeared and gained uh, a huge following without ever putting out a book, a printed book. Here are some examples just to, to show, but there are many, many more than this. Uh, so, where we are right now in Brazil is that we're coming out of a very, very bad experience in the last four years, especially economically speaking because of the pandemic and the government. Uh, so printing costs are up, a lot of newsstands closed, a lot of bookstores closed. Uh, but on the other hand, we have uh, the indie production is higher than ever. There has never been so much comic books being published in Brazil than now, but we have the least amount of readers in history. It's weird. We have more being made and published and less people reading. So it's kind of a weird graph. What's happening? Oh, economy and you have Netflix, you have webtoons, you have your cell phone, you have video games. Comics are kind of a bubble. Comics are niche. They are niche here too, but they are niche. But if you are inside it, it's a gigantic universe. Uh, okay, give me quadrinhos. I would like to, uh, do you have time? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you guys uh, some reading suggestions that you can find here because they were published here in English, so it's easier. Okay. Uh, we have here a lot of different comic book characters from Brazil reading comics, and this guy is my character right here. So, uh, first of all, we have Run For It by Marcelo de Salet. Uh, this book was published by Fantagraphics and won the Eisner Award uh, recently. The Eisner Awards are the top awards for comics in the United States. And he won for best foreign comic book published in the US. Yes, go Brazil, yes. <laughs> so these are stories uh, about uh, enslaved people and their fight for freedom. Powerful material, super cool, super great. Uh, Marcelo is also, a, a, aside from being an artist and a teacher, he's also a historian and a researcher. So he would research a lot of the, uh, the history behind the Quilombos, the enslaved people too. So he knows what he's talking about. And this is the one we have here, right? Yeah, yeah. Room for It is available at uh, Stony Brook's library. I don't know if it's in Portuguese or, or English, but probably English. I think yeah. Okay, uh, next is Picture of Favela by André Diniz. André Diniz is a writer and illustrator, uh, a dear friend. I made a book with him once, too. Uh, this is the biography of the photographer Mauricio Ora. So André will tell the story about this photographer from the favela using his own style of drawing and Mauricio's photos. It was published in Europe, like many countries in Europe. He won a lot of awards for that, too. We have Meta. Love this one. Uh, also friends of mine, you see it's a small world after all. Uh, this is super cool because it's the department of metalinguistic crimes. And they are detectives that investigate crimes that are committed inside the stories. So in this story, they go inside a comic book uh, to try to find the murder murderer of the creator of the comic book. But this is a comic book, see? It's super cool. Also, it's in this uh, story that the character grabs the word balloon and hits the other with that. Uh, Vincent, originally in Brazil, he's called Valente, means brave, but then he's Vincent here. Uh, it's a comic book by Vitor Cafage. Uh, Vitor is one of the authors of that uh, Monica's Gang graphic novel that became the movie. So he was making Vincent, he made the Monica's Gang comics, and the readers there went back to read Vincent. So 
the cycle continues. Uh, it's the story of this guy, he's a dog, he's fresh out of high school, he's a loser, but with a gigantic heart. And he likes RPG, he likes Star Wars, he likes Lord of the Rings, he's a super nerd, and he doesn't know how to talk to girls, and these are stories of how his heart is going to be broken many, many times. It's super cool, super beautiful. Uh, it was published by Super Genius here. Blast Cure by my friend Mario Cesar uh, is the story of Acacio. Acacio is uh, a guy, uh, uh, he's going to go through a very difficult journey of coming out of the closet. The thing is, uh, he denies it. He, he doesn't know he's gay and then he knows, but he fights it and then he doesn't want to admit it and then he does. It's very, very uh, dramatic because he's from a very religious family. And also, if you notice, uh, you have the pink and the blue. The whole comic is colored only in pink and blue. And everything that is male, like straight guys, male, is blue. And everything that is female or straight woman or whatever, it's pink. And sometimes the colors will like match. And he will be wearing like a pink shirt with blue trousers and then he's in the middle of the, the conflict. And sometimes it's purple. It's beautiful. Very sad also. Uh, Bay Tripper, uh, please excuse me. This is not a journey, it's a journey. Okay. Uh, this is a very uh, special comic book actually because Evan said, you're making comics in Brazil. You are Brazilian making comics in Brazil. It depicts the Brazilian culture. This is exactly that but it was published first in the US. First here and then in Brazil, it's curious. It's the story of Brás, he's a writer, and in every chapter he, it's going to be a spoiler, but it's on the first chapter, okay, so forgive me, he dies <laughs> in the end of the first chapter, but then in the second chapter he's alive and he's older and he kept living. So every chapter you see him die in a different way and continue living. It's a story about life and death and love and, and trying to live up to your parents' expectations. Light stuff. Okay. Uh, Mesmo Delivery by Rafael Grampa is a, it's very, it's like action packed, like a Tarantino movie. Uh, two truck drivers are driving around to deliver a very dangerous cargo. That's all you need to know. And then there's a lot of blood. Also, the graphic design, this is phenomenal. Uh, Listen, Beautiful Marcia is the latest book by Marcelo Quintanilla, but the first book by Marcelo Quintanilla published in, in the US. He's like a major author, won a lot of prizes in Europe, in Brazil. Uh, he lives in Spain nowadays. And this is, like, this is a family drama. It's just that, like people trying to get along, people trying to understand each other. It's beautiful, it's sad, and it's so Brazilian. The dialogue is beautiful, uh, the, cine the, the landscape, the, the backgrounds are beautiful. Uh, his style is very photo photographic, and in this book spe specifically, the drawing is realistic, but the coloring is like cartoony. But it's, it's a great story also. Uh, the Few and Cursed, also by my friend Felipe Canho and uh, Fabiano Neves, is a post-apocalyptic Western. So the world ended, everything went to shambles, and people were riding horses and fighting demons with pistols. It's really cool, also. Love Kills by Danilo Beirut is a story of love, death, and vampires. Uh, it's like, not super genius, but if you like vampires and you like like dramatic love stories with action, yes. This could be very, this could be a movie. Probably will be in a few years, I don't know. Uh, Funny Creek uh, is the story of this girl, she runs away from home and she enters, she escapes to the cartoon world of the shows she watches. And then she's interacting with these clowns and cartoon figures, but she's theoretically a real girl. It's very cool too. Uh, Necromorphos is also a very cool 
a comic by my friends Gabriel, a Heiss and a Bell. Uh, it's the story of Douglas. Douglas is like a teenage boy, and he has this weird power that if he touches uh, any kind of body part of a dead person, he becomes that person. So I mean, if he, he there's a story where he has like a, a piece of bone from like Mozart, I guess, or Beethoven. He becomes Beethoven, like, but with the mind of the the, the boy, and it's really really crazy stuff too. Uh, but also, if you guys like to read uh, digital comics and you don't want to buy necessarily books, and if you can read in Portuguese or kind of risk or try. Uh, there is this new app called Funktoon. We uh, we nicknamed it uh, the popsicle in a hat because of the the, the mascot. Uh, it's like Webtoon, okay? It's an app or a website, and you can access it and log in for free and read tons of Brazilian comics of all genres, styles, and 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 whatever you want, you're gonna find that. I have an idea. You can take my class for the semester. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Factu was created by Guara, uh, which is a, a publishing house from Brazil too. Uh, I'm part of Guara's uh, artists team, so um, I was kind of involved in, in making some of their comics. Uh, yes. Okay. To finish it all. I'm gonna leave you guys with this trip by strip by Laerte. Uh, the guy is saying, "You are surrounded by ignorance. Leave the book with hands up." So read more comics, guys. I believe I really, really, really believe I know that you're gonna find something interesting to read in comics. Uh, they're not just like people fighting or funny stuff or I don't know sci-fi. There's there's anything any kind of theme or genre or style, not only in Brazil, but also worldwide. Take a chance. Think about like a movie you like or a genre you like or an art style you like. I'm sure you're gonna find a comic book right on that, that alley, okay? Uh, I guess that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>